So thank you all for joining us today. Um, ASK has worked really hard to formalize partnerships with organizations across the country that we hope will benefit our members and the residents that you all are serving. Um, a few years ago, ASK formalized a partnership with the California Health Advocates, which is one of the senior Medicare patrol organizations in California. And through that partnership, um, California Health Advocates has brought forward an organization that serves states throughout the country. Levanta, who is with us today, is a Medicare contracted quality improvement organization that provides advocacy and resources to Medicare beneficiaries. Um, and Levanta has graciously agreed to join us today to help spread the word about the resources that are available to our members and to allow them to better assist the residents that they're serving. Um, these services are free of charge to you and your residents. Um, so today we have Brian Fisher and Gina Westfall with us from Levanta to discuss how you can access and take advantage of the supports and resources that they offer. So please um, feel free to ask them questions as they're going through the presentation. Um, following their presentation, Mickey Nozaki, excuse me, um, from California Health Advocates will take some time to talk about trends and fraud related to Medicare. Um, and so with that being said, I am going to turn things over to Brian and Gina for introductions. So Brian, give me one second and I will pass controls over to you. Thank you, Nina. Um, it's, a, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I want to uh, just introduce myself. I'm Brian Fisher. I'm one of the communications leads here at Levanta. Um, we are one of Medicare's, we are one of two of Medicare's beneficiary and family-centered care uh, quality improvement organizations. And uh, that we're going to talk more about a, a lot. Of, we're going to talk a lot more about that uh, a little bit later. Um, so I'd also like to take this opportunity to introduce my colleague uh, Gina Westfall. Uh, Gina is my counterpart in Levanta's West Coast office. I'm based out of Baltimore, um, and uh, I can tell you that uh, yes, I have seen the wire. Yes, it is accurate, but that's not actually how how most of us uh, live here uh, in Baltimore. Most of us actually kind of like it here. Um, so anyway, um, it's a pleasure to be here. Gina is going to be monitoring the chat. So if you have questions uh, during the presentation, the best thing to do is to put those in the chat and we will try and address those as we get through them, uh, as we get through the presentation. And then at the end, if there are any questions that we haven't been able to address in the chat, uh, we can take those at the end. And then if we have any time uh, before I turn things over to uh, my colleague, uh, Miki Nozaki at the Cal Health Advocates with Cal SMP, um, we will uh, try and address those questions then. So. Again, uh, we're, just to uh, go a, a quick overview about what we're going to talk about today, uh, we're going to talk uh, specifically about Medicare's Beneficiary and Family-Centered Care Quality Improvement Organization Program. That's a lot of words, um, and so we typically shorten that to BFCCQIO. Actually, we really just say BFCC, um, and we're going to talk about what that entails and how it all works and what are the benefits of this program. Uh, we're going to talk about specifically, though, about Levanta's role as a Medicare contractor um, and how to access those services uh, that are provided by Levanta as a Medicare contractor. Um, I want to be very explicit, though, before we get into the presentation that this applies to Medicare beneficiaries. This does not apply to Medicaid only. If you have, uh, if you're working with a, a resident or a client that is a dual eligible, they are both Medicare and Medicaid. These services only apply to those services that are, uh, to healthcare services that uh, have been paid for by Medicare. Um, so as long as Medicare is a payer on that specific stay or on that service, then you are eligible to use the QIO program. But this is a Medicare only program. It does apply to dual eligibles, but only if Medicare is a payer on that particular care. And at the very end, we'll just have a quick knowledge review. So uh, don't worry, it won't be graded um, and uh, we will not be putting it on your, your permanent record. So you've already heard me use the acronym a couple of times, QIO, and that stands for Quality Improvement Organization. The QIOs are actually almost as old as Medicare itself. So when Medicare was originally created, in the 1960s, the federal government very quickly recognized that there needed to be some kind of accountability. 
Um, that is to say some sort of quality assurance to, to verify that the care that was being billed to Medicare was of good quality and met professionally accepted standards. This essentially has remained the same. This, this, has, this goal has remained the same, but the program has adapted and changed dramatically over the ensuing 50, nearly 60 years now since its um, inception. Um, and so there are actually two kinds of QIOs. So uh, as I said earlier, Medicare, or excuse me, Levanta is what's called a beneficiary and family-centered care quality improvement organization or QIO, beneficiary and family-centered QIO. And as the name would suggest, we work primarily with Medicare beneficiaries and their families and caregivers and advocates. The other type of QIO or quality improvement organization is called a quality innovation network. We call them QUINs for short, QINs. And they predominantly work behind the scenes. They work with uh, you know, public health entities like state and local government. They work directly with Medicare uh, certified healthcare providers, and they are given discrete tasks by Medicare itself. And so, for example, they may say to Medicare, Medicare may say to the Quality Innovation Network for a state, you need to improve specific measures in your state for patient safety or um, you know, readmissions or something like that. So you may hear about them. They may, you know, you, you may be aware that they exist, but they generally do not work directly with Medicare patients and their families. That is sort of a, a professional um, uh, and sort of public health oriented um, uh, or type of organization, but we share the same mission. And that is what you see here on the screen. It's what many of you know, if you have a background in healthcare, this is called the triple aim. It's better health, better care, and at a lower cost. Um, this is a concept that was, it's about 40 years old. And at this point in our um, sort of development of the healthcare industry, it is sort of baked into everything that we do. All of our decision-making, all of our policies, all of our, you know, really everything that we do is, is being driven towards this goal. Better health for the patients, better care for the patients, and doing so more efficiently and at a lower cost. So the BFCCs also have a very discrete set of tasks. And as I said, these are oriented towards the Medicare patients, the beneficiaries and their families and caregivers. Um, and so there are three main services that are provided to Medicare patients and their families by the BFCCQIO program. Far and away, the largest of those services the, the in, in terms of volume are discharge and service termination appeals. And so an, an appeal in this case is not usually what most people associate with that word. Most people associate the word appeal, particularly when it comes to Medicare, with a, um, a coverage denial. Um, and that is not something that the, the BFCCQIO program does. What we do is if a Medicare patient or their family is in a certain type of care setting, and we'll talk more in detail about that later, and the healthcare provider determines that they are ready to move on to the next level of care and the patient or the family or advocate disagrees with that decision, the patient has a right to appeal that termination of services. And we'll talk way more in detail about that. But to give you an idea of the scale, of this program. Levanta is one of two BFCC QIOs across the country that perform these services. Um, and since 2014, when Levanta begin, began this type of work, we have processed over 900,000 cases. Of those 900,000 cases, about 700,000 of them were appeals. Um, so it is a very, very high volume um, uh, line of work. The other types of cases that we handle for Medicare patients and their families and, and caregivers are quality of care complaints and immediate advocacy. Um, we're gonna talk way more in detail about each one of those a, a little bit later, 
but suffice it to say, this is all part of Medicare's assurance of quality health care. At the end of the day, Medicare wants to, wants to verify and assure that the care that they were providing um, you know, through their reimbursement was of uh, good quality and adhered to medically accepted professional standards. Um, an important takeaway, though, from this particular slide is the services that these services that I've described are yours by right. So as long as you are a Medicare beneficiary, regardless of what type of Medicare that you have, so whether you are uh, have traditional Medicare, so you know the traditional Part A, Part B uh, Medicare, or you have a Medicare Advantage plan, these services belong to you by right, and they are important. And importantly, they are provided at no cost. So you will never ever receive a bill from Levanta or the other BFCCQIO, our colleagues um, at, at an organization called Keypro. So what you see here is uh, is a map of the states that Levanta covers. So we cover 27 states and territories across the United States. Um, the ones that are colored in here are covered by uh, Levanta and the ones that are grayed out are covered by our colleagues at Keypro. And I want to be very explicit about this. If you, regardless of whether you live in a Levanta state or you live in a Keypro state, this process is exactly the same. We may have a few little differences in terms of um, you know, procedures, like our intake process might be a little bit different than, than Keypro's. But the programs are identical. They are exactly the same. So whatever Levanta is doing, you will also um, have access to that uh, from our colleagues at Keypro. Um, they are just as good as we are. Um, we, we, in fact, we work with Keypro uh, frequently. Um, and they're wonderful to work with, and you should never, ever feel hesitant to call them if you live in one of Keypro's states. But one of the reasons I show this map here is because you know, I talk about the difference between a Levanta state and a Keypro state. What determines which QIO you're going to call is the state in which you received the care. Uh, so, for example, if you live in, uh, in, in California, as many of you I'm sure do, um, if you live in extreme Northern California, and let's say the closest major hospital um, is like in Salem, Oregon, or something like that, or you need complex surgery that can only be done in Portland or something like that, and it's faster to transit, you know, it's more efficient to go into to Oregon for that surgery, and you need to contact the QIO, you would contact our colleagues at Keypro, even though you live in California, which is serviced um, by Levanta. So that information will be conveyed to you in this, the healthcare setting that you are in. Um, and it's important, to, and, and we'll talk about how that happens again. But to review, the three main services that are provided by the BFCCQIO program, regardless of where you live, Regardless of who your QIO is, these services are exactly the same and they are provided to you at no cost by right. So those are appeals. So your uh, right to appeal your discharge or termination of skilled services, your right to file a formal complaint, and your right to request immediate advocacy or what's sometimes called advocacy services. Um, and we'll get into a lot more detail about each one of those programs in just a second. So to begin with the eligibility. So as I mentioned earlier, you do have to be a Medicare beneficiary and the care you received or are receiving has to be paid for by Medicare. Um, and so if you want to uh, appeal your discharge or your service termination, that has to be in one of what we call the big five care settings. So that would be hospitals, hospice, home health agency, a skilled nursing facility, or a comprehensive outpatient rehab facility, or sometimes people call it a CORF because people love acronyms. Um, I'm a reservist and I can tell you that people in the military really love acronyms. Um, so the big five settings for eligibility for a discharge appeal would be hospitals, hospice, home health, skilled nursing, and comprehensive outpatient rehab. Critically, though, it, it's really important to remember that you must be in an inpatient status or a or skilled services status. You cannot be in an outpatient status or an observation status to request an appeal of your discharge. Um, 
what often trips people up here is that if they are like, let's say you're in a hospital and you're in an outpatient status or you're in observation, um, technically you haven't been admitted to the hospital and these uh, your right to appeal your discharge only applies if you have been admitted to the hospital or if you are receiving skilled services in one of those other care settings. Um, and so what I, what I mean by that, well, so for example, if, if we talked about observation or outpatient in a hospital, if you are in a skilled nursing facility and you have gone past your discharge day and your discharge time, then the, the right to appeal your decision would then have expired for that particular stay. To file a formal complaint about the care that you receive, you do need, uh, I'm sorry, the only eligibility for that is again, that you are a Medicare beneficiary and the care that you receive was paid for by Medicare. Um, so all care settings that accept Medicare are subject to quality of care review by the BFCCQIO program. So that means you have the right to file a formal complaint to us or the other BFCCQIO key pro about care that you received in any care setting, whether that is your family doctor, um, whether that is a hospital, anywhere in, on the healthcare spectrum, as long as Medicare paid for it. The statute of limitations for the quality of care complaint, though, is three years. So you can't be any further than three years out from the date of your service. The only exception to that rule is if you want to file a quality of care complaint about an, a dialysis facility. So if you are uh, receiving ESRD or end-stage renal disease uh, benefits uh, and getting dialysis, you would need to contact what's called the ESRD network if you want to file a complaint um, about, the, uh, about, your, about your dialysis clinic. Um, any of the BFCCQIO, so whether it's Levanta or Keypro, um, if you call us, we will, of course, refer you back out to the ESRD if you don't have access to a computer and you, and you don't have that phone number and can't look it up. Uh, similarly, immediate advocacy applies to any care setting, regardless of what type, as long as it is Medicare certified and Medicare is paying for that particular care. The only catch with uh, immediate advocacy is that it is voluntary on the part of the healthcare provider. So if the healthcare provider doesn't want to cooperate with us for immediate advocacy, they don't have to. It's in their best interest to do that, um, but they don't have to. Most of them do. A quality of care complaint, the healthcare provider, they are subject to that. They do not have the right to re refuse to cooperate. Similarly, with the appeal, the healthcare provider does not have the right to refuse uh, to cooperate. These, uh, um, the BFCC QIO program is a condition of those healthcare providers' participation in Medicare. So when those healthcare providers are certified by Medicare, they acknowledge that they are subject to BFCC QIO and QIO jurisdiction. Um, and again, this is regardless of whether you have traditional Medicare or you have a Medicare Advantage plans, your rights are exactly the same. So at this point, people usually say, Brian, this is really good information, but how in the heck was I supposed to know about this? Well, there are, there are two main ways that people find out about the QIO program. Um, unfortunately, the, the most common way that people find out about the QIO program is when they are already in a, in a medical crisis. What you see on the screen here is an example of, one, of a kind of what we call a Medicare patient notice, sometimes called a beneficiary notice. And these are required by law to be issued to Medicare beneficiaries at certain times during their uh, healthcare um, interactions. The one you see on the screen here is, is a very, very common one. This one is called the important message from Medicare. Specifically, this is the one that you would get in a hospital. Um, there is an, another one that's kind of like the, the sister to this form. It's called the notice of non-coverage. It's very, very similar. Um, the content is virtually identical, but it is issued to patients at a, a post-acute setting, like a skilled nursing facility or other post-acute setting. But critically, as I said, the information is pretty much the same. So it, it delineates your rights as a Medicare beneficiary. But crucially, it also has the, the name and phone number of the QIO for your state. So you see this form here is formatted for California, um, and it's got the name of the hospital. 
you know, name and hospital address there. It's got the name of the patient. It's got the patient's identification number, and it's got the name and the phone numbers for the QIO for California, which in this case is uh, Levanta. Um, so this is one way that patients find out about their rights. Specifically, the important message is required to be issued to patients uh, twice, actually once upon admission, and then once again upon uh, notice of discharge. Um, and that's pretty typical. Um, you will always get these notices by law um, around two days prior to your scheduled discharge, whatever type of facility um, that you happen to be in or whatever the care setting you happen to be in. The other way that patients typically find out about us is through the annual publication of what is called Medicare and You, which is an annual publication that CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, publishes every year and is distributed to all Medicare beneficiaries and new enrollees as well. There is a section about QIO program rights in there. Um, it is typically towards the back. Uh, when I helped my parents enroll in Medicare about 10 years ago, um, you know, they, uh, they, um, they, uh, I can tell you that I did not get to that. I was not uh, working for the QIO program at that time. And I can tell you that once we got through sort of the the sort of the, the meat of that and you know, how to enroll and what the benefits were and whatnot. We, we put the document down and we didn't come back to it. Uh, later in life, uh, when I came here to work uh, for Levanta, um, it obviously became much more important to me, but that information is in Medicare and you every year. And the third way, and I think the reason why we are here today is Medicare patients find out about this, uh, about their benefits when they talk to people like you. Uh, so folks like you are absolutely, as you, as you I'm sure know, are the front lines uh, for helping older folks uh, who are on Medicare to understand what is going on, what's happening to them. And uh, you, know, you are the first line of defense. You are the folks that they are gonna ask first. Um, and it's so important. And, I, and again, I, I really am grateful for the opportunity um, to talk to you today because, again, word of mouth is, is just as important as being available, you know, being Googleable uh, and finding stuff on the internet because people actually tend to trust more what others are telling them uh, as opposed to what they may find on the internet. So, how do you start a case with Levanta or the BFCCQIO program? It may sound strange, um, particularly when I'm talking to uh, audiences in, in California uh, because of you know Silicon Valley and everything. Um, but you do need to call us, um, and so all cases with the BFCCQIO are initiated by phone. Um, you know, I always joke about it's. It seems strange. You know, I. I, I I do my grocery shopping, you know, with, with my phone. Um, right. And, uh, you know, I can order food with my phone and I don't have to interact with, with <laughs> human beings. Um, but in order to, to start a case, you do have to give us a call on the phone. And there's a very good reason for that. And that is, that is security. Um, this is very serious business. Um, and just as if you were calling your bank or, you know, some other, you know, um, entity that, that has, important information that could be used to harm you, you know, your private information, we have to verify your identity. Um, and so that is why you do need to initiate a call by phone. Um, the call center is open Monday through Friday, nine to five, and then 11 to three on weekends and holidays. Uh, however, if you choose to leave us a voice message, you're more than eligible to do that. We have a, a you know, we, we, we have plenty of space on the, on the voicemail system. So leave us a message. Uh, if you call us at three o'clock in the morning, you know, you're more, you're more than welcome to do that. We're not going to pick up the phone. I don't know where our staff would be, uh, but they're not at work. Um, and we will call you back on the next business day. Um, and so that is how you initiate a case. Um, so if you are doing that for one of your residents, you will need to complete and submit what is called an appointment of representative form. This is a standard CMS. It's a standard Medicare form. It's a CMS 1696 form. You can download it uh, from our website. You can download it directly from CMS. Uh, but this is not a power of attorney. This is what this the form really does is gives you as, as representative for the patient access to their protected health information, their PHI. And so it allows you to, to act on their behalf uh, in regards to the QIO program. So to start a case, 
but crucially to receive information about that case, to be read into it, to get the same updates that the patient or the patient's family is going to get. It's a very simple form. Um, again, this is not a power of attorney form and you will need to send this into us um, in order to act as the patient's representative. In order to do that, when you call the helpline to start the case, they will give you the fax number to send this into. Um, and I know, again, I'm using words from the last century, but we do uh, take this by fax. Um, you know, if you're doing for a, a less time sensitive thing like a, a quality of care complaint, you can mail it in, that's no problem. But for an appeal, you really do need to get this into us by fax. Um, and uh, the representative on the phone will give you the appropriate fax number to send this form into. So what happens after you call? Well, the first thing that happens is we actually, well, sorry, we, we have to verify eligibility, um, but we will stay the discharge. So we will tell the hospital or other care setting that the patient has requested an appeal and they are not to discharge the patient until we have completed that review. Once we uh, do that, the, the healthcare provider will send the medical records over to us and we will assign the medical records to one of our physician reviewers. So all cases are reviewed by a licensed board certified um, physician. Uh, so these are not retired physicians. These are not you know, foreign physicians or anything like that. These are American doctors who are licensed in their states. They are board certified, by, and that is actually by a contract requirement with CMS. Um, and so you can be assured that they are active doctors who are treating patients, and they are reviewing cases uh, between patients and sometimes uh, well into the night. Um, appeals are complete within 24 to 48 hours. Statutorily, we have up to 48 hours in most cases, but typically um, they're turned around in about 24 hours, sometimes less, depending on when the case comes in. As I mentioned earlier, a second ago, a quality of care complaints are less time sensitive, obviously, than, than an appeal. Um, and those are typically completed within 30 to 45 days. Immediate advocacy um, is usually completed within five to seven business days. Immediate advocacy is unfortunately not available on the weekends at this time. Um, so those are uh, those cases are, are worked uh, during business hours on weekdays. Um, everything is going to be told to you by phone. So again, you're going to get a call from us um, on uh, the outcome of your case. So particularly with an appeal, that's very, very important because it's very time sensitive. Um, and uh, with a complaint, same thing, you're going to get a call from us. And you're also going to get a letter on a complaint um, detailing the results of the review. With an appeal, you will also get a letter if you request a copy of that, and most people do. They just want it for their records. So I have a couple of, of quick uh, examples of, case, of cases here, and these are fictional cases, but they are based off of real cases that we have seen over the years here. So in this case, we have a patient who is a, a Mrs. Stevens, who is a 77-year-old female, and she is receiving uh, health care services at home through a home health agency, and that is because she is recovering from surgery. As a part of Mrs. Stevens' discharge plan, she received one, or she is to receive one week of home health services for wound care and for physical therapy. And so, you, as a, um, you know, as a friend, as a neighbor, as a you know, son, daughter, etc., um, you notice that you know Mrs. Stevens is uh, still very unsteady on her feet, um, and the wound dressing, you know, it's not really in place, and something's going on. Um, you know, what is going on here? There's something. There's something amiss. Um, and so, what what should you do? The first thing you need to do is check the date on Mrs. Stevens' Medicare notice. So remember, we talked about the, uh, the notice of non-coverage, right? The Medicare form that you get two days before your discharge, right? So same thing here for a home health agency. So Mrs. Stevens, two days before her coverage ends, the home health agency is required to give her notice of that. And that notice, like we talked about, is going to have her rights there, and it's also going to have contact information, but it's also going to have the date and time of the end of her services. So as long as you are inside that window, so let's say she got, you know, she sells you, oh yeah, I got that form this morning. 
great. You are two whole days out from the end of the covered services. And what should you do at that point? If you think, okay, you know what? I think the home health services are, you know, it's not going well. She's not making progress. She may need more physical therapy. She may need more wound care. You should then go ahead and call Avanza, call the BFCCQIO and initiate the appeal. And the reason why it's so important and so, you know, it's like, it's great that it's two days out is because there are two different kinds of appeals. You have a hospital appeal and a non-hospital appeal. At a hospital, if you are appealing a hospital uh, discharge, you can wait until the very last minute. So, you know, if it's, it's right now, it's where I'm at in Baltimore, it's 1.32 p.m. I just saw the time tick over to 1.32. And if your discharge is scheduled for 1.33, you have 60 seconds to get, uh, to get the call into the QIO. And it may take 24 hours uh, for us to review that case. But for a hospital stay, you will never be uh, potentially liable for those 24 hours. Um, and that is because under CMS regulations, under Medicare regulation, a hospital stay is considered life-threatening. Um, that is to say your life is in danger if you are not in the hospital. That's what it means to be admitted to a hospital. If they admit you, that means your life is in imminent danger. Um, and so because of that, uh, you know, you can wait up until the last minute to file that appeal. At a post-acute setting, like in uh, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Stevens' case here, in a home health setting, if she waits until the last minute uh, to file the appeal, yes, it will still be timely. And let's say it takes 24 hours, and our doc comes back and says, "You know what? Um, you know, I, I know what she. I know what you're saying. I understand, but you know, the, all her vitals and everything, and her ambulation, she is ready to end services." And if you technically would then be uh, liable for any time that has gone past your scheduled discharge uh, date and time. So if you are in one of these post-acute settings, if you're thinking about filing an appeal, it is absolutely critical that you file that appeal as soon as possible to avoid any potential liability. Um, so those are your two big types of appeals, and I'm sure we will have more questions about that later. So some important things to remember about filing the appeal. Every case is unique. If you choose to leave us a message, leave us a single comprehensive message, you know, we just give us as much information as possible. If you leave us more than one message, that will actually delay our response time. But again, important to remember that a, a licensed board certified physician is going to be responsible for reviewing that. So let's talk real quickly about a complaint here. So we have a patient, Mr. Alvarez, he was in the hospital last year, and he uh, he's being treated for chronic uh, high blood pressure. And so he tells you in conversation that last year when he was in the hospital, you know, he says, ah, they just gave me so many pills. And, uh, you know, I got confused and I was trying to follow what was on the bottle, but I got dizzy and I passed it. Okay, I'm not a doctor. You should not pass out from taking your prescription. Um, something is going on here. This is a problem. And so what should your next steps be? You need to call Levanta, call the BFCCQIO program. We will pull Mr. Alvarez's medical records and we will figure out what the cause of the issue was. In this case, um, this actually was uh, based off of a real case here. And so in, in, in this case, and, and uh, one of my friends is a pharmacist and we were talking about this case. And she asked me, she said, Brian, what's the difference between 10 milligrams and 100? milligrams. You know, and I'm, I'm snarky. So I said, well, duh, 90 milligrams. And she said, no, the answer is a single keystroke and renal failure. Um, you know, and that put it into really stark contrast, right? So in this case, what we found out was that there, um, in this hospital case, there was no medication reconciliation. So that is a standard practice where the doctor, the pharmacist meet together to make sure all the prescriptions are right. You want to you want to read some stuff. Google the cons, the, the term polypharmacy. It's pretty wild, um, and it's something that is really really um, a major part of modern medicine. 
Um, all the prescriptions have to be balanced. It's a very, very delicate um, and very important process. And in this case, it didn't happen. And for this patient, he had an imbalance in his prescription. So he was having a drug interaction uh, because the dosage was too high for one of his prescriptions. And so this is something that we will review. We, we determined this, and then we actually worked with this hospital to help them design new um, uh, medication reconciliation procedures so this would not happen again. So to file a complaint, again, you have the right to file a complaint up to three years after uh, the date of service and any healthcare setting is eligible for that. But again, I wanna be also clear about this. The results of our review may not be used as the basis for a lawsuit. Um, and that is because the quality improvement program is designed to find errors in the healthcare system and correct them. We are not out to punish healthcare providers. We are out to identify where they had flaws in their processes and correct them and help them build back better, help to educate them to improve processes. Because at the end of the day, for many of us who live in rural areas, there isn't healthcare choice. You may only have one regional hospital for, you know, in the entire county or even several counties. And so it's so, this is why it's so important because if we don't know what's going on, we cannot help improve the, the healthcare. And so in a place where there's no healthcare choice, the quality improvement organization program is extremely critical. The other thing that you should understand is that patients should never fear retaliation. What the QIO program is, again, that we have jurisdiction over these healthcare providers. So, you know, when we file and when a patient files a, a quality of care complaint, that is essentially Medicare stepping in. And so patients should not fear retribution. They should not fear retaliation. Patients cannot lose their coverage because of filing a quality of care complaint or an appeal. That is not the case at all. I, unfortunately, we hear people uh, often say they're afraid of that, uh, but that is not the case at all. Okay, so I have one more case study here for you before we, before we start to wrap up, and I apologize, uh, Mickey, for taking more of your time. Um, so we have here an immediate advocacy case. So we have uh, Mrs. Price here, who's 72 years old. She recently changed primary care physicians, and she's being treated for chronic conditions. She has blood clots. Um, and uh, she uh, recently, because her new physician got a new physician, the new physician recommended and changed her prescription. So she has questions about it that she was too polite to ask during the visit. She gets home, she calls the doctor's office, can't get a call back. What should she do? She can call Levanta, call the BFCCQIO program, and we will advocate for her. And you know what? Sometimes it's uh, it's just a matter of hey, this is Levanta, or um, you know, this is the BFCCQIO program for Medicare calling. One of your patients has a problem. She wants to know why she can't get her questions answered. Um, and so. In this case, what we did was we actually facilitated a three-way phone call between uh, Mrs. Price's physician and her. So we made sure all of her questions were answered um, to her satisfaction. And then the result of this, actually the, the, the new physician gave Ms. Price um, uh, her cell phone number so she could call anytime or shoot her a text. Some people do text. Uh, my parents actually, I taught them how to text and that was a mistake. Sorry, mom and dad. Okay. Anyway, so uh, moving on. Uh, and again, this is eligible for any, um, any type of, of care setting. So um, important to remember about immediate advocacy is as a voluntary process. So if Ms. Price's doctor did not want to participate in that, unfortunately, we could not have forced her to do that. It is an informal alternative mediation service, uh, but it is available for any healthcare setting that accepts Medicare, and it is available in real time. But again, it is voluntary. So as we come to the conclusion here of my present of my slides, just a couple of quick uh, questions for review. What is a QIO? A QIO is a quality improvement organization, and QIOs are government contractors that ensure quality protection for Medicare patients and their families and caregivers. What are the services that are provided by the BFCC QIO? Three main services: appeals quality of care complaint and immediate advocacy. So discharge appeals, complaints, and immediate advocacy. How much do the services cost? 
All services are provided to Medicare patients and their families at no cost. They are free. As my second favorite four letter F word is free. This is regardless of whether you have traditional Medicare or you have a Medicare Advantage plan. As long as Medicare is a payer on that care, you have the right to access these services. As professionals, we have some resources that are available for you. We have flyers that are available. So if you live and work in one of Levanta's states, you can absolutely um, download these directly from our website. If you happen to be in one of Kipro states, they have similar resources that are available for you. Um, Medi we, uh, Levanta has a Medicare Helpline app, which you can use to contact us. It also has information in it. And it also has our online case tracking tool. So if you file a case with Levanta, you can track your case through the app. Um, Keypro, I don't believe, has an app, but you can uh, track cases uh, with them through their through their website. It's very very easy to use. Um, we would ask that if you have questions, you may email us, but you cannot email us any protected health information. I cannot tell you how many emails I get with the patient's name and the subject line. That is, I, you, I handle those emails with a, with a special tongs because that is protected health information. You should never send protected health information over email. It is not secure. If you have general questions, you can email us at communications at levanta.com. As professionals, I would ask that you follow us on any of our social media feeds, but particularly I would ask that you follow us um, on LinkedIn as professionals. Our website is levantaqio.com. We have a weekly e-journal that we publish called the Levanta Compass that I think you may find useful as well. So I'm going to end on this slide here with our contact information for the states and regions that we cover. And then uh, we still have a couple of minutes here. Uh, 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 so we do have a question from Beverly Robinson. She states that, uh, do states that did not show up on Levanta coverage areas have a similar QI out of contact? Um, Beverly, yes, as, as we described, uh, there are two key, uh, QIOs that do this work for Medicare, one of them is Levanta, the other is called Keypro, K-E-P-R-O. Um, and you can go to their website, which is Keypro, K-E-P-R-O-Q-I-O.com. So Keypro, Q-I-O, if you live in one of Keypro states and their phone numbers are available there as well. Um, the services that are provided are exactly the same. Um, so what we do, they do and vice versa. Let me bring up my colleague uh, from Cal SMP. Let me bring up her slides. And um, we will, uh, I will turn things over to Mickey. So uh, Mickey, it's on you. Thank you, Brian. All right. Um, and you can move to the next slide if you would. Hello, everyone. Uh, Brian, that was incredibly valuable information. So thanks for sharing all of that. And thank you all for being here today to listen to us. So today, uh, as Brian did with Medicare rights, I'm gonna talk about how we protect Medicare beneficiaries from all the scammers and the fraudsters out there. Because we get an awful lot of calls and complaints and reports about fraud from folks like you, the residential service coordinators and your clients. So we get things like, uh, oh my gosh, I'm enrolled in a health plan. I don't know how it happened, but all of a sudden I can't see my doctor. I can't get my meds. Or, um, you know, I'm getting all of these packages uh, delivered to my doorstep um, and it's got medical equipment and diabetic test strips and I don't know why I'm getting it and I don't need it. What do I do now? Or, very seriously, seriously. Um, some, of your, some, of your, some of your residents, your residents who, who have difficulty, difficulty. Echo here. Brian, Mickey, I think you, you may need to echo? turn your volume, Mickey, you may need to turn your volume down just a little bit. Um, okay. Hmm. All right. Yeah, she says I'm breaking up here. All right, let's try it. Let's try this. Um, okay, and or, or or seriously, a resident who um, it has difficulty seeing their doctor or getting their medications because all of a sudden they found out that they were enrolled in hospice. They didn't know how they happened to be enrolled in hospice. They're not terminally ill. So what do you do now? You call the senior Medicare patrol. Uh, so next slide, please. So um, I'm going to talk about the top 
fraud trends. This is what we're getting reports from you guys and also your residents. Um, the number one complaint, and no surprise, which is happening right after Medicare annual open enrollment, is the misleading marketing of health plans. We got telemarketers and TV advertising, door-to-door -door cold calling, agents and brokers promising all sorts of things like thousands of dollars back into your social security. Very misleading. So please remind your residents that brokers and agents cannot solicit apartment to apartment. They can't cold call without the beneficiary's permission. And yet, yesterday we got a call from uh, a Spanish-speaking woman in Butte County. She got a cold call from an agent. The agent convinced her to meet and sign up for a Medicare special needs plan. Now her medications are not available to her. She can't see her primary provider. So we are working through the issues they called the Senior Medicare Patrol. We have contacted CMS. We're working through it all to get her disenrolled from the wrong plan and re-enrolled into where she should be. So although we recommend that people actually annually review their Medicare health plans to see if there's potential savings, let's say for their medications, we have to make sure that they are aware that there is misleading advertising out there, like the Medicare give back. And also know that there is local resources available to you and your residents through the high cap counseling, that's Medicare counseling. There are 26 agencies all throughout California that provide free, local, and unbiased information about Medicare. And there's the toll-free number right there on the screen. All right, next slide. Medicare's durable medical equipment program has been rampant with fraud ever since it was established. We get so many calls from people who say, oh my gosh, I've got packages delivered to my doorstep with back braces and knee braces and shoulder braces and diabetic test strips and genetic test kits. What am I gonna do with all of this stuff? I didn't even ask for it. Well, unfortunately what happens is people will either steal the Medicare number from your residence and then all of a sudden start sending them packages of really cheap goods, but charging Medicare thousands and thousands of dollars for expensive medical equipment. And it all goes on your residence Medicare records. So we need to be really, really careful. And a lot of the times um, your resident service coordinators will call us um, and, and just ask for some advice. You know, we, we got a call from a, a, a medical equipment vendor and they really want to come to our apartment building and talk to all of our residents. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't, you know, have them uh, and host them. However, you need to make sure that they know they are not allowed to ask for personal information like Medicare numbers. And also let your residents know. It's really important that they understand medical equipment covered by Medicare is medically necessary only and prescribed by their own doctor. So just really be careful about those guys. Next slide, please. All right. One of the most serious complaints we get involves hospices that trick people into enrolling in Medicare hospice when they're not terminally ill. And the ramifications for your residents is really, really dire. These illicit hospices accost seniors in supermarkets or they set up tables in parking lots, senior centers, markets. They make false promises. They take photos of people's Medicare cards. And the hospices use really deceptive tactics and provide a lot of incentives, which some people find hard to turn down. 
you know, they, they offer them all kinds of free groceries and, and, and insure. And sometimes they even pay them hard cash in order to sign up for hospice. But the victims typically don't understand what hospice is. They don't understand that when they sign that paperwork, the hospice indicator goes on their Medicare record and it prevents them from seeing their primary provider, getting their needed medications, sometimes even having to cancel necessary surgeries. Sadly, we're working a case right now where a woman was tricked into enrolling in hospice, even though she's not eligible. She's a breast cancer survivor. And she called us when she had gone to the pharmacy to get her, her prescription, which is a breast cancer inhibitor that she's been on for six years. And all of a sudden she finds out that the pharmacy is denying her right to have that prescription. She doesn't even know why. After research, we find out that she was enrolled in hospice. She didn't even know how. So now we're working to unravel the fraud and get her records reinstated properly so that she can get her medications, so she can see her primary provider. So anytime you run into this kind of an issue with one of your residents, please call the Senior Medicare Patrol. Next slide. And finally, I know it's no surprise at all that the scammers have taken full advantage of the pandemic. Ever since the onset, we have so many COVID-19 scams, it's pathetic. And the scammers, they're still at it. And they changed their tactics to stay up with the times. So currently, we're seeing fake at-home COVID tests, telemarketers offering what they call free cardiac genetic testing kits. Just a Q-tip that they tell people to swab and send back. But all they're doing is collecting Medicare numbers so they can send fraudulent claims to Medicare, get tons of money, but the victims are the beneficiaries and all of this fraud goes on their Medicare records. And lately, what we're seeing on the right-hand side of your screen is a fake COVID-19 pop-up test site. We're seeing these interestingly very close within walking distance to a lot of senior apartment buildings. So we need to let people know those scammers are only out there for one mission only, and that's to obtain Medicare numbers and other personal information to either steal from the senior or steal from Medicare. Next slide. And that's the whole reason we're here. And we are so grateful that residential service coordinators report fraud and scams to the Senior Medicare Patrol. So we're here today to remind you all that the information you heard from both Brian and myself are available to your residents as virtual webinars. And I know Senior Medicare Patrol does in-person presentations all throughout the state of California. We have fraud prevention flyers in nine languages. You can order them for free and post them in your buildings. And we have our toll free hotline, the 855 number you see on the screen. It's a direct line to us. We do a lot of research about fraudulent billing. If somebody is a victim, we try to figure out what the problem is and help them so that they're whole again. And then we refer all of our cases on to law enforcement because it's so important to get all these bad guys out of the system. Now, if you're outside of California, there is a senior Medicare patrol in every state and the four territories. So if you are outside California, you can go to the website smpresource.org. 
smpresource.org, smpresource.org, and find your local Senior Medicare Patrol. So as a final reminder, you're all invited to attend the California Senior Medicare Patrol Annual Conference. It's going to be virtual. It's on March 23rd. And if you are an early registrant, you may just win a $50 Uber Eats voucher. So if you're not on distribution, please call our toll-free number and we'll have a registration link sent directly to you. So again, I wanna thank you all for being here, for being such great advocates for your, your residents and your clients. And I think I'll stop here so we can take any questions. And yes, slides will be made available. And uh, if, if uh, you are interested in any of our flyers, or any of our information, please call that toll-free number on the screen. We'll get stuff right out to you. Again, uh, we do presentations all the time. We do an awful lot of webinars that are publicly available and in-person presentations all throughout the state. So let me just check chat and see if there's anything here. The high cap phone number. So again, in California, the state health insurance programs, and there's 26 of them, they're called high cap. And that number is 800-434-0222. Okay, so that's that. And let's see if we have anything else. Uh, the flyer information, uh, Jonathan, um, I'm not sure what flyer you're referring to. I'm very happy to make any of our materials available. So if you would like to give us a call at the 855 number, that's 855-613-7080. We're happy to share all of our resources and uh, point you to our website. Ah, and Twyla, Twyla, if you're in California and you had uh, you have a resident that had hospice fraud and durable medical equipment issues, please give us a call at the 855 telephone number, 855-613-7080. And I think that's all. Are there any other questions? We have one minute. We do. Uh, Nina, Nina knows how to get a hold of all of us. So if you have any questions and think about it later, definitely let her know. Yes, definitely. And thank you, Mickey and Brian and Gina, for your time today. This was amazing information. I appreciate you know you taking the time to share it with everybody. Um, as I said before, we will be sharing the slide deck with you all after the presentation. Um, in that email, you will find an evaluation link for the presentation today. Um, and then once the recording has finished downloading, we will make that available to you all through our eBulletin so you can review the presentation again in the future. Or if you'd like to share it with a colleague, as I said before, please feel free to do that. Um, with that, I think we are good to go. Thank you all so much and have a wonderful day. Bye.